So in this question, we're asked to find the local maxima and minima of the curve y equals sine x plus cos 2x. And we are given uh, a restriction on our domain here from 0 to 2 pi. So trig functions are, are periodic, so they normally have an infinite number of solutions because they repeat themselves infinitely. So typically, when we're asked to find a maximum or a minimum, we'll be given a restriction on our domain, so we know that we only have to look in that particular interval for the solutions that we want. And a typical restriction is 0 to 2 pi, so we're only looking from 0 to 180. Sometimes it'll be given as um, negative pi to positive pi. Again, a range of, of only 2 pi. So if we're going to find the maxima and minima, what do we need to do first to our function? Brain. We've got to find the derivative, right? So sine x, let's see, sine x plus cos x, our derivative is going to be the derivative of sine x plus the derivative of cos 2x. We know the derivative of sine x, that's cos x. When we have to do the derivative of cos 2x, we have to remember that this is a composite function. It's cos is our outer function and 2x is our inner function. So this is going to be the derivative of our outer function, which is negative sine 2x, keep that inner function the same, so the 2x has to stay inside there, and then we multiply by the derivative of that inner function, which is just going to be 2. So cleaning this up a bit, we get cos x minus 2 sine 2x. If we're trying to find the local maxima and minima, what do we want to do with this? Well, we want to set this equal to 0, and we want to solve for x. And here we want to run into a problem. Because our trig functions don't have the same argument. Okay? One of them has a cos x, and one of them has a 2x. Sorry, the argument of, one of the cos is x, the argument of the sine is 2x. And if we're going to solve this, we need to have the same argument in both of our trig functions. So we're going to have to get this sine 2x to be something in terms of just x. How do we do that? Well, we flip to the back of our learning guide, we pull out our handy dandy trig identity sheet. This is the only time that you're going to need trig identities in this unit, is when you are given an equation that you have to solve for x. So we work our way down this sheet, and we find, oh, there's only one identity for sine 2x. It says that sine 2x is equal to 2 sine x cos x. So I'm going to replace sine 2x by 2 sine x cos x. Okay. And I'll just make a little note here. I'll say that we have used an identity. And I think this is the time when you want to use the identity, right after you've taken your derivative, before you've done too much algebraic manipulation of your derivative to try and solve. So now that we've done this, um, well, the next step is going to be pretty easy here. I'm just going to multiply those two twos together to get 4 <coughs> sine x cos x. So I have 0 equals cos x minus 4 sine x cos x. How do we solve this? the same way we have always solved these questions where we're setting it equal to zero. We want to factor that right-hand side. So what is common to these two terms? Well, we've got a cos x that is common. So let's factor out the cos x. And I get 1 minus 4 sine x. Now that this is in factored form, what do we do with each of our factors? We set each of them equal to zero, and we try to solve them separately. So we're going to have cos x equals 0, and we're going to have 1 minus 4 sine x equals 0. Now, how do we solve these separate, simple little equations here? Something like cos x equals 0, you just kind of have to know what the answers are based on what that cosine function looks like. So if it helps, sketch yourself a little uh, diagram of that cosine function, which, you know, goes kind of like this. And you only have to consider it from 0 to 2 pi 
because that was the um, that was the restriction we had on our domain. So where's this thing equal to zero? Well, right here and right here. That's going to be pi over two, three pi over two. So right away we've got two solutions. Okay. Now we've got this other equation that we want to try and solve. So let's rearrange this a little bit here. Uh, we can bring the negative four sine x over to the other side. So one equals four sine x. Divide both sides by four to get sine x equals one quarter. Sine x equals a quarter. Now, is one quarter one of those fractions that we recognize from the special triangles? No, it is not. You can see Van shaking his head there. So what do we do if it's not a special triangle and it's not one of these nice pi over two, three pi over two, things like that? What do we have to do? Ring. Let's stick it into our calculator, absolutely. So we're just going to find x equals the inverse sine of 1 over 4. With cos x, we are working with radians, right? We got pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. So we should make sure our calculator is in radian mode when we get our solutions for um, inverse sine of 1 over 4. So we punch this in. I get something like 0, 2, 5, 4, which is an excellent solution. But is it the only possible solution to this? Okay, this is where our cast rule comes in again. Okay, so the equation that we're solving is sine x equals one quarter. Okay. So if sine x is going to be positive one quarter, there are two places where sine is positive. Quadrant one and quadrant two. This one right here is our quadrant one solution. Okay? Because your calculator always gives you the quadrant one solution, or sometimes if it gives you a, n a negative number, it's giving you the quadrant four solution sometimes. Okay? So if we've got our quadrant one solution, we need to figure out what our quadrant two solution is. Well, let's see. The quadrant two angle is from here to here. We know that the related angle from the x-axis to the terminal arm is going to be 0 0.253. So our angle is going to be 180 minus that 2.53, or 180 in radians is pi. So our second solution is pi minus 0 0.253. which gets us something close to 2.888. So these are our four critical numbers. Pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 2.53, and 2.888. We need to figure out whether these critical numbers represent local maxima, or local minima. So we've got a couple of options here. First derivative test, we could set up the interval table, and check the sign of our first derivative in each interval, or we could use the second derivative test. Find our second derivative and evaluate it at these four x values here. I'm going to use the second derivative test. So I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to find my first derivative and I'm going to look for sort of the simplest kind of first derivative that I, ha that I can have here. So the simplest form of my first derivative is this one right here, before I applied the identity. Okay? That's what I'm going to take the derivative of to get my second derivative. If I, take the, if I take the derivative of this term, of this form down here, after I've applied the identity, I've got to use product rule, which is a little bit more complicated. 
Okay, so I'm just going to copy that one down here. So y equals it was cos x minus 2 sine 2x from there. And now I'm going to take my, oh, I'm sorry, and that was my first derivative, right? So now I'm going to take my second derivative here. So derivative of cos x is negative sine x. I'm going to have 2 times the derivative of sine 2x, which is a composite function. So it's going to be derivative of sine is cos 2x. And then I have to multiply it by 2 again. So my second derivative is going to be negative sine x minus 4 cos 2x. So at this point, I just have to plug those x values into my second derivative. So let's just use this notation. I'll just do y double primed and then what number I'm subbing in. So we had pi over 2. We had 3 pi over 2. We had 0.253. And then we had 2.888. Okay. And then this is just calculator work here. So I get value of 5, that's value of 3, negative 3.2, and negative 3.2. So what does the second derivative te test tell us? If our second derivative is positive, as it is with 5 and 3, Remember, this is telling us that we have a local minimum. So we have a local minimum, another local minimum, and then if our second derivative is negative, we have a local max. two local minima, two local maxima, and the final step would be to figure out what the y values were that corresponded to each of these x values. So our final conclusion would be something like that there are local min of, let's say at, uh, let's say local minimum points, and I'll just do pull in there, so pi over 2, the y value it turns out is 1, 3 pi over 2, the y value turns out is negative 1. And then our local max our x values here are these decimals 0.253 and 1.125 and we have got another one at 2.8 8, 1.125 as well. So we've got each of our four critical points with the value associated with each. So we've identified our local minimum points and our local maximum points. Um, when I'm evaluating, when I'm using my calculator to evaluate these trig functions, I usually keep three decimal places. There's no particular reason for it. I just know that three decimal places is enough accuracy to do whatever I want. So it's just a good rule of thumb.